trying to work our way up to get to the Germans and the machine gun, when from behind us came the fire of a sniper. He was still back in the woods where we had been, where Captain Faust and the rest of the company was. Somehow or other, he was hidden back there and proceeded to shoot at us. And one by one, we were picked off. I was hit in the back of my chest. And I do remember clearly my first thought is, well, this is a fatal blow. The bullet hasn't come out. It's just a matter of minutes. But I know I thought, let's finish the job for get to the top of the hill. And the other men were all hit. Martin Murray was hit in the eye. He later was totally blind after that day for the rest of his life. But the rest of us that were hit, but not seriously, and we did work our way up the hill, throwing hand grenades or whatever we did, and the Germans took off with the machine gun and ran down the next hill. And so the hill was ours. I was able to lead one of the men, I don't, rem don't know his name or I don't remember it, and Martin Murray, and we went back down our hill. I suppose one of the most significant moments of my life was when we found Captain Faust and I was able to say to him, we took the hill. That's it. Good evening. My name is Jim Bays. I'm not going to be able to talk about Europe, but I can tell you a lot about the Pacific. Now, of course, it took both areas in order to win that war in World War II. I want to tell you a little bit about before the war and a little bit during the war and a little bit after the war. I was raised by my grandparents. Unfortunately, I didn't have the parents to give me the parental guidance and the mentors that I could have used, but I had some great grandparents. And so um, I was doing real well until my grandmother passed away. And I'm living there with my grandfather and my uncle. And, of course, they were elderly, and I'm kind of a young buck, you know, at that point only 13 years old. So I was not too happy about this situation, and I really didn't know to, what to do about it, but I knew I had to do something. So I decided I was going to quit school. Now, at 13 years old, quitting school was not a very wise decision, you know, but I thought, well, uh, I can't stand around here. So I decided to get out of the house and I moved downtown to Indianapolis. I found me a job with the Western Union delivering telegrams on a bicycle. Well, it, it paid two dollars and a half a day. And so with that, I thought, yeah, I can do pretty good. I found me a, a bunk in the hotel for 25 cents a night and 10 cents for a foot locker. So I moved in. The truant officer picked me up about a week later. 
<laughs> and he took me back to my grandpa's. Well, I stayed about two weeks and I left again. And this went on for about three months, back and forth, back and forth. But I was determined. So at any rate, I uh, stayed there and was that worked on that job for two years. And one morning, a friend of mine, Fred Coghill, said, boy, today is the day. And I said, what's that? And he says, I'm going to join the service. And I thought about it. I said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. I said, I'll go with you. So we head over to the recruiting office, and we go in, and I pass the physical, and we're doing real well, you know. And so we, I said, well, okay, what, where do we go to? And he says, you got to have a birth certificate, man. I said, I don't have one. He said, well, you got to have it. I said, well, I'm 17. No, he's got to have a birth certificate. Well, we were disappointed. We left. About two weeks later, Fred says, Jim, he says, we got this deal sewed up. I said, how's that? He says, I got a guy that's going to go down there with us and tell him that he's your father and you're 17. I said, good. So we went. He told him about how old I was. And he was my dad. And they bought the deal. So there I am three days later on a train heading to Great Lakes, United States Navy. So I spent six weeks in the boot camp. And at the end of that time, why, uh, I said, you know, uh, you got to be assigned. And I said, where am I going to go? I said, I want to be on an aircraft carrier. He said, no, no, no. He says, that's all filled up. There ain't no place to go. I said, where am I going to go? He says, amphibs. I said, amphibs? What's that? He said, well, he said, we're going to send you to Oceanside, California at a marine training camp. And you're going to learn how to drive one of those LCVPs, which is a landing craft vehicle personnel. And he says, you haul the troops into the beach. I said, that's not what I envisioned at all, being in the Navy. I said, that's dangerous, man. He says, that's where you're going. So that's where I went. I went to Camp Pendleton, California. So here I am in there during this training. I did pretty good. And I became a... Coxswain, which is the one that was able to drive the boat. Now, this is a landing craft vehicle personnel, which is a Higgins boat made down in Louisiana. It holds 38 crew, uh, Marines. It has three crew on there with my, is a coxswain. I had two gunners mate and a bowman. So, I'm assigned to a ship. And on the ship is an APA. It's an attack personnel attack ship, amphibious. And they carry 25, and of course, four men on there with the, that gives you, you know, 100 men. So uh, with that, uh, we go for some maneuvers, and we head to Hawaii. We get into Hawaii, we do some maneuvers, and we're doing pretty good. Now, basically, what my full career was, and I'll wind it up in a pretty quick point there on that, was that uh, I landed on... Saipan, Tinian, Guam, and I'll tell you about Iwo Jima. Now, when you start, first of all, with combat, there's a lot, a lot of bad memories in it, and it affects you mentally. They call it PTSD. I want you to know that I've spent almost 50 years going to the VA, and um, with these PTSD courses. Five years ago, uh, the counselor says, uh, Jim, he says, you know, you, you've got to start doing some talking and you've got to get out and, and you've got to get with it. Now he says, you need some closure. He says, can't you find some of your old shipmates or something? I, I don't know. So I, I got on the internet and I typed in the USS Highlands APA 119. Pops up there. Henry Sampley. Well, I remember Henry, and he's in California. So I picked the phone up, and I called Henry. And I says, Henry, this is Jim Bays. There's kind of silence on the other end of the phone. He says, nah, nah, can't be. I said, yeah, I'm talking to him, I'm the one. He says, can't be. His boat was blowed up, and there ain't nobody left in that boat. In fact, we got a memorial down in, 
in Sebring, Florida at one of our reunions and on the headstone down there, your name's on it. And I said, <laughs> holy mackerel. So I thought, this, is, this, this can't be. So at any rate, um, they um, had a reunion coming up, so I went down to the reunion and uh, introdu reintroduced myself to my shipmates. <laughs> And it was, it was quite a good story. We bonded very quickly. And, and um, so with that, um, it was a, a real good reunion. So I've been able to talk about it since. And it's been a good thing that I have. It relieved an awful lot of stress, a lot of tension, and a lot of problems. So with that, I want to give you a little insight as to what it was going into Iwo Jima. Now, you know, the location of Iwo Jima is about 750 miles from Guam. Guam is about 1,500 miles from Tokyo. Right close to a neighbor island there is Tinian and Saipan. Tinian is the area in which the big boy and the little boy bombs were assembled and ready to pack into the B-29 for an attack upon Tokyo if they could get there. But the problem was getting there. As the bombers would try to hit into Tokyo, they'd have to circle a long ways around Iwo Jima because there was two airfields on there and the Japanese knew that's where we were going to have to go and that's when they would send up their fighter planes and blast them out. And a lot of them, our, ship, our aircraft was lost in that direction. So they knew that somewhere along the time they were going to have to protect that island. Now, with that, um, on the February the 17th of 1945, uh, the USS Highlands and their 25 LCVPs arrived about three miles off the little island of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is four miles long and two miles wide. And I want to show you a little bit of the, the movie as to what that looks like as to when you're looking at Iwo Jima and give you a little bit of information on that. In February of 1945, an epic confrontation took place on an eight-mile strip of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Iwo Jima. The only value of the island was its strategic airstrip located just 625 miles southeast of Tokyo. If taken, the outpost would be close enough to Japan for fighter escorts to accompany and protect Allied bombers on their missions. The date of this camera slate is just five days before these men would again have to battle the Japanese. Any diversion helped take their minds off the difficult task ahead. The capture of Iwo Jima was expected to take 10 days. It took 36. It was the bloodiest assault in the history of the U.S. Marines. On February 17th, the shelling began. The morning erupted into a firestorm of shells and rockets. A war correspondent on one of the ships wrote, I can't help thinking nobody can live through this, but I know better. The shelling stopped as 120 carrier planes set off to strafe the island with napalm and gunfire.
But this ferocious bombardment failed to rouse the Japanese from their underground shelters throughout the island. On the morning of February 19th, 60,000 Marines boarded their landing craft for a two-mile trip into the unknown. These men were mostly veterans of other Pacific struggles, and the only thing they knew for sure was that they would confront a very dangerous and very devious enemy. It was expected that 15,000 of these Marines would become casualties. As it turned out, that figure was conservative. On the ride in, some soldiers tried to master Japanese phrases. But small talk would be little help against an enemy willing to sacrifice his life for the Emperor. This is how it looked from inside the landing craft as the first waves hit the beach at Iwo Jima. The Marines' first great obstacle was the volcanic sand, so loose that American tanks could barely get a grip on the stuff to move inland. One exasperated private trying to dig a foxhole said, it's like digging a hole in a barrel of wheat. By 5 p.m. that day, 30,000 Marines were on the shores of Iwo Jima. The first objective was Mount Suribachi. Inside the extinct volcano lurked 1,200 Japanese soldiers in a honeycomb of caves and bunkers waiting to mow down the approaching Marines. The Japanese plan was to allow the Americans to come ashore, move inland, then be butchered by mortar and machine gun fire from strategically located pillboxes. While the Marines were able to initially get off the beaches, many found themselves back there after being wounded inland. These Marine... That was the beginning of the invasion on Iwo Jima. I wanted to show you just a little bit about it. The problem was that they knew that the Americans were going to take that island, or try. The general that was in charge of that island had had some training in the United States, so he knew exactly that the General Kurobushi was expecting to see the Americans arrive. He spent four years building up a defense on that island the morning of February the 19th uh, at 4 a.m., we were called to the mess hall. And uh, as a boat crew, we got orders. Said, okay, uh, at 6 a.m., uh, you shall report to your boat and you will lower, have your boat lowered alongside and at 7 p.m., you'll start loading troops. Now, the night before, uh, we were given a lot of instructions, and they said, you know, this will take five to seven days. We'll probably clean this island out of here, and uh, it, it won't be that big of a deal. Well, you know, it, it looked like after they had been bombing this thing for about 22 days, and with the old 16-inch uh, shells upon it on that island, there wasn't anything left on top. They couldn't find, the reconnaissance couldn't find anybody living up on top of it. Of course, we didn't know they were all living below it. <laughs> and so with that, it was, it was quite a problem. So uh, we loaded our boats, and um, so the boat master says, okay, you form a, a rendezvous, which we did. That's going around and around and around. And uh, so at, at uh, uh, 8 a.m., he said, well, you got to, the flag and you form a wave. So with that, uh, the wave was formed. They said, all right, now when we drop the flag, you got 38 Marines in that boat and you got your three crewmen along with you, 
And he said, you head for that beach, and there ain't no turning back, and you pull that throttle on that LCVP gray marine engine, and you pull her full bore. And you go till you hit that beach. And when you hit that beach, lop that ramp and let them out of there and retract back and come back and get some more. Well, there's 1,800 Marines laying on, on an APA, and none of them are anxious to get off of it. And they're not anxious to get out on the APA, on, on our LCVP either, going on the beach. So your orders are, you don't leave nobody left on the boat, you leave them on the beach. So I'm in the boat number 13, LCVP number 13. Well, I wasn't, you know, uh, worried about the number of the boat. I was worried about getting back. And so I knew uh, my experience in Saipan, Tinian, and Guam that um, the, the problems was where the Japanese were buried, and they weren't buried that way on the other three islands that I landed on. So I knew that was a major, major problem. So I'm in the second wave heading to Red Beach 1, which is down about, uh, about 60 yards off of Mount Suribachi. Um, moved in, heading for the beach. We got within 20 yards of that beach, took a direct hit. The next thing I know, the Marine is pulling me uh, out of the surf and laying me on the beach. I said, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I got to get out of here. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Navy man. I'm not a Marine. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, buddy. He said, you're going to be a Marine before you get over here. Well, it took me six weeks to learn how to be a sailor. It took me one hour to learn how to be a Marine. <laughs> one hour. So what happens? I'm laying there, and he says, well, he says, you know, you're banged up. Your back's all tore up. Your leg's messed up. And it looked like you got something that hit you in the back of the neck. He's, so, so he got a corpsman over, a Navy corpsman. And the Navy corpsman came over there and looked me over and he said, man, I don't know. He says, uh, I said, well, get me on a, you know, another LCVP going back. He says, nobody's going back, friend. He says, you're all here. There ain't no way to get you out of here. Said, okay, what I do? The fellow, the Marine that pulled me out of the surf was named Jack. Jack says, until I go out, he says, you just have to stay with me. He says, now you're in the 4th Marine Division, 24th Regiment. Well, that wasn't too good of news, I'll tell you that right there. I'm laying there on my back in that black sand, and I want to get out of there, but I can't. So the Navy corpsman put three wide belts around my back. Later, I found out I had four vertebrae blowed out. And so he pumped me full of morphine. Well, that, I felt pretty good after he got that morphine. <laughs> so with that, why, you know, Jack got over there, and of course there were dead Marines all over the place, and, and so uh, got me a Thompson submachine gun, got an M1, got a new helmet, got a poncho, yeah, got a helmet, shoes, I'm a Marine. So there's a nice big ridge going through there, to me, I didn't know where all these pillboxes were or didn't know what they were in them. But at any rate, as you come over that ridge and it's just black sand and you can't hardly run in it, you'd come up that far up in your ankle. And so uh, I wasn't doing any running anyway. But anyway, there was more craw crawling than anything. So uh, we got over the first ridge and uh, there we stayed. We, we were in a gully and you couldn't get out because the machine gun fire coming over the top. And that's what you got. So with that, we stayed there for about three or four days. Well, on the 23rd, the morning of the 23rd, I look up on Mount Sarabachi, and here they got a flag up there. And in front of that was six men standing there, and Joe Rosenthal was taking pictures of them. About an hour later, they take the flag down. And I said, yeah, you know, I thought the world was about over here, you know. Well, they... What had happened, a Navy man had, on an LST had a larger flag. The flag that they put up there was just a small flag and it had on a water pipe. And so they took that flag down and they got the bigger flag and they was raising that up and Joe was just standing there just clicking those pictures, you know. 
Well, the reason that that flag on an angle has been chosen is they sent that to the Associated Press, and they chose that because they figured that it would sell war bonds for the United States. That's how that flag happened, picture happened to be, but that's the second flag raising. That's not the first. So a lot of people think that's the first. So with that, the morning of the fifth day, why I said, you know, we can't lay in this valley all day and forever as we get to get out of here. And Jack says, well, the only way we can get out of here is take that darn pillbox out of there, machine gun nest. So I said, I'll get on, I'll crawl up in that thing there if you guys cover me. I'll come over, I'll get cover up that thing and I'll, I'll zip a grenade right down his belly. Well, um, I did crawl up through there and they covered me with gun. I got, I got up there close to that thing and I could hear him in there rattling and tearing, talking up and hearing that. I got up close to that thing, I pulled the grenade in, I throwed that dude in there and said, bye you mothers, you know, and boy they went. Well, it was clean it out. Well, we was able to move from there on. And so then on the morning of the, well, it was the ninth day, uh, 29th, um, they said, tonight we're gonna take this airfield. So there was five of us, and Jack was one of my friends who was in there. He said, you're going to 